Today is a special day, the 75th anniversary of VE Day. What were you doing 75 years ago in Margate on VE Day? As I remember, we had the day off school, and there's lots of rumours of parties and things, and I remember roaming about Cliftonville in the dark when I was eight. I can't remember if there's anyone with me, I hope so. And there were bonfires in all the roads off North End Road. I can remember that, and I had jinks. And very exciting because it sets the tar alight. A couple of years, there's these great holes in several of the roads. At that time, there was lots of British troops being repatriated from prisoners of war camp. Thousands were billeted in Margate, and so there was all sorts of all the Commonwealth around. So eventually, I went back home to be greeted by a great raving party going on in the music shop. And there was my mum, who was a, liked a bit of a party. She dragged in anyone who's passing. There were soldiers, there were Maoris, New Zealanders, Canadians, all having a big sing-song, and it was very hilarious. Until my uncle came in, and he was a bit indignant, because they were all sitting on these pianos. The sea had a cold, grey, angry look the first time my mother took me to Folkestone. Folkestone itself had the weary air of a town that had been struggling for its very existence. Many were the shattered remains of once fine houses. We stayed at the Esplanade Hotel in Sandgate Road for that November half-term weekend. While access to the town had been difficult, the beach was impossible. We sheltered under some discarded linoleum in the overgrown gardens beside the lower Sandgate Road, gazing through entanglements of barbed wire at the thundering breakers. It was to be another six months before we were there again, for an Easter break in 1945. Memory this time is of the harbour area. The jetty was out of bounds, but the old fishing harbour could still be explored. A way down to this was through the bale, down a twisting flight of steps between high walls and derelict buildings. At the top of the steps, the end building had a great round hole in its wall, the entry point of a German shell. From that building, on that damp March afternoon, came the sound of a radio and rough voices. The tide was out, with a few boats in the harbour stranded on the mud. We went under the low arch and along the cobbled quay past the fish sheds. Beyond the fishing boats, sitting upright on the muddy bottom, the jetty was hidden by a liner. She was grey and too funnelled. She too was high and dry on timber bolts, exposing her rudder and propellers. A panel proclaimed her name, Victoria. Beyond the fish market, we came to an area of sand, sandcastle sand, well cleaned by the sea. War had also visited this corner. On the beach lay the remains of a small ship being slowly demolished by men with cutting torches. I recorded the scene in my sketchbook. The notice on the cliff, Danger Mines, discouraged such innocent pastimes as sandcastle building. I was about three and a half years old when the war broke out. We didn't know any other way of life. And, um, it was nothing to us to see Spitfires, Messerschmitts and flying over overhead and they were so low you could actually see the pilot in the plane. <clears throat> My father was the village bobby. The police station was a, a wooden single car garage in the grounds of this bungalow which was opposite our bungalow. We lived in Lindus Road in Dimchurch which was about a hundred yards from the sea. A lot of the houses in that road were commandeered for military use, but we were one of the few houses that weren't commandeered. And in Lindas Road and Mitcham Road, which is the road adjacent to it, there was two bombs, an aerial torpedo, and a B-17 Flying Fortress all crashed in those roads. Hmm. It was pretty lively. But as a kid, you see, we didn't play, we didn't have any sports grounds or anything like that. And you went out and played on a bomb site and run around all over the place. Tim Church School was built um, in the 30s of Canadian Pinewood. And it was a very nice school, modern school. There was a very small uh, class, uh, one teacher. You only went half a day. And that half day, you probably spent in the air raid shelter, just singing and with a lantern or a candle. 
there was only about two buses a day went between Lyd and Folkestone, the 105 it was. If you were on the bus, the bus had to pull up and the military police got on the bus at the Grand Redoubt and also at the other end, at the High Knock end as well. They came on and checked your identification and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and make, and as kids, make sure you got your gas mask with you. If you didn't have legitimate business there, were you turfed off the bus? Oh, no, no. you you I, 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 That... I don't know what happened there because I never experienced it or even saw anybody that wasn't because everybody knew everybody. You you knew the bus driver, you knew the bus conductor. Um, in fact, mo you knew most people on Romney Marsh, not just in church. Um, but um, although there were bowls and moles of barbed wire right the way along this coastline, um, you couldn't go onto the beach, for instance. Um, I mean, the whole of the, dim the sands at Dimchurch were mined. And one of the few places that hadn't got barbed wire or mines was Dungeness. And it was often thought it was left there for spies to come ashore uh, intentionally so they knew where they were. And on, in, on, on a few occasions, on a few occasions, they did come along this coastline in a U-boat and unload the spies at Dungeness and they were all very quickly caught. Well, my father actually was uh, instrumental in catching um, two of them. He had a bicycle and he had a, a, Smith, a Smithson 38. He caught two of them, him and some others, and they, um, they were taken to the prison um, at Seabrook, which is now that new block of flats there by the petrol station. Um, but during the war, it was uh, there was a prison there, a police a police jail, and um, these these spies were taken up to to London, and they were hung as spies. Are you still in your meter place then? Uh, yes, and we also been out for a while because it, it got all smashed up when the shall hit Rita Place. That was right opposite our flat. There was three houses, six flats, and, and they were, the centre ones were totally destroyed. And uh, the lady in the flat opposite ours, the bottom flat, she was killed. Sadly, I don't know her name. But above them was my friends, Mr. and Mrs. Hanson and Eddie Hanson, one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. And they were very badly wounded. Yes. And uh, myself, by that day, we'd been lucky because I'd just gone up to Mrs. Frost in 18 Ivy Way and I was playing in the garden with her daughter and my mum was having a chat with Mrs. Frost. And then suddenly we was playing and then suddenly there's this huge power and and there's like a wind, and then this huge explosion. And then, of course, these six flats had been destroyed. I was very lucky because I had some shrapnel had come through the bush, but because I was only a young boy, my head had, had gone in, and uh, I got a permanent dent, dent in me. But luckily, they said if I'd have been 12 or 13, it would have killed me. But I was lucky there. But when I went down, at my mum's flat and our flat was there was no windows, no doors, and my mum's wardrobe had been picked up like workmen had done it, and it was thrown right onto her bed. It was a hell of a mess. But the the, the one good thing come out of it, I was uh, my mum and my I had to go to uh, go to my grandmother's in Waterloo Road in Sheraton, and uh, the Americans took us over took me and my mum and uh, some of our belongings. And, and I always remember as a little boy, uh, we got to the traffic lights in Blackball Road in Folkson, which are not there now, and the American driver suddenly told me, I'm sorry, son, I've got no chewing gum. Which to me was the biggest disaster of the lot. <laughs> <laughs> to know, to actually be riding with American soldiers, and they haven't got no chewing gum. You know, for a little boy, I thought, blimey. This is, this is rotten up, this is. 
Within Martin Philpott's account of life during the Second World War, he mentions the shelling of Reed Place in Folkestone, which happened on the 13th of September 1944. He recalls how a woman, who we now know to be Charlotte Martha Simpson, aged 66, who lived at 13 Rita Place, the flat opposite his family's flat, was killed in the shelling. Shelling is an artillery projectile and is quite different from bombing in that they cannot be heard when they are being dropped. During the Second World War, Kent experienced both shellings and bombings with coastal towns such as Dover and Folkestone receiving a larger amount of shelling due to their proximity to Nazi Germany-occupied France. These shellings resulted in the death of 32 civilians, including Charlotte Simpson, seriously injuring 64 civilians and slightly injuring 102 civilians. If we were to include air raids and flying bombs, Folkestone's casualty statistics rise to 123 dead, 240 seriously injured and 538 slightly injured. On September 26, 1944, the guns in Calais fell silent for good. This was a result of Operation Undergo, the siege of Calais, led by the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division. Throughout the coastal towns in Kent, people were able to leave their houses seeing friends and families, enjoying walks along the beach, going to restaurants, pubs and cinemas. They could enjoy life once again without the fear of shelling. The Royal Hippodrome on Snargate Street in Dover was destroyed only 24 hours before the shelling stopped for good. Despite the unfortunate situation, the front street bar of the Royal Hippodrome was opened in time for the celebrations throughout Dover. Thank you.